Hey, what's up guys? In today's video, I wanna talk about the severe side effects that I've seen in some of my patients or some of them that can theoretically happen and if left untreated, can ultimately lead to bodily harm and death. So let's get started. If you've been following my channel for a while, you know that I'm a huge proponent of GLP-1 agonist therapy. It's been life-changing for so many patients and it's been life-changing for me and for my own personal health. So I do feel like if I'm able to educate you more on some possible negative side effects that I've seen firsthand as a physician in the hospital, I think it's important to keep this as a warning sign for things that could be going wrong and when to seek medical attention promptly. The first side effect I wanna talk about is pancreatitis. So what is pancreatitis? It's the inflammation of your pancreas, which is the organ that sits right below your xiphoid process and is responsible for secreting insulin. So it plays a huge role in blood sugar management, but it also secretes a lot of enzymes that are necessary for the digestion of fatty acids. The most common cause of acute pancreatitis is heavy alcohol consumption in a short period of time, or basically binge drinking. So I see it very commonly in young adults who come from a college party or just had a massive amount of alcohol at a recent event. I also see it a lot in alcoholics who kind of come in actually frequently with these episodes and actually frequent episodes of pancreatitis can permanently damage the pancreas and lead to something which we call type three diabetes, but that's a discussion for later. The second most common cause of pancreatitis is actually gallstone pancreatitis, where you can have stones that build up in the gallbladder that can actually block the exit of the enzymes or of one of the ducts in the pancreas, and it causes buildup of the pancreatic enzymes into the pancreas and leads to generalized inflammation. Pancreatitis in and of itself is not deadly. However, one of the most deadly consequences of untreated pancreatitis is called necrotizing pancreatitis. Basically what that means is the pancreas becomes so inflamed that the tissue of the pancreas actually starts to die off. And this leads to a cascading event where one segment of the pancreas can start dying and that'll trigger further necrosis or death of the nearby tissue as well. And if left untreated, this can actually lead to severe organ failure and eventually death. So what are some warning signs or things that you should be cautious of? One, if you have a history of pancreatitis, I highly recommend not starting on a GLP-1 agonist unless you are in close communication with your healthcare provider or if you're following an endocrinologist. The second thing to watch out for is any sort of severe nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain that is relentless and just feels completely abnormal. I do believe that you guys know your body best. So if this is a type of nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain that is so severe and debilitating that you can't keep any food or liquids down, I highly recommend going to an ED to get evaluated for possible pancreatitis. I do wanna say though that GLP-1 agonists in and of themselves do not increase your risk for pancreatitis compared to other antihyperglycemics such as sulfonylureas or DPP-4 inhibitors, which also act on the pancreas. Any medication which acts on the pancreas increases your risk for acute pancreatitis. The next side effect I wanna talk about is gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is when your digestive tract and the gut motility slows down very significantly to the point that food is not moving through your small intestines or through your stomach properly. This is actually most commonly seen in patients that have any sort of neurological or nerve damage, and actually most commonly in people who have poorly controlled type two diabetes, which leads to ultimately neuropathy. I think you've all heard of people who have type two diabetics who may have pain in their fingers and toes. However, there are nerves throughout our entire body, and there are nerves in our GI tract which help facilitate the movement of food and digestive byproducts throughout the GI tract. When there's damage to those nerves, it can lead to gastroparesis. So the deadly consequence of gastroparesis is actually aspiration. So the esophagus sits right behind the trachea. And when food products start to build up into the intestines, back into the stomach and up actually through the esophagus, which I've seen in a lot of patients who have severe gastroparesis, it will easily go into the trachea. The trachea, which was commonly known as the windpipes basically, is a one-way shot into the lungs. And when you have any sort of byproduct or foreign material in the trachea or lungs, it's a huge, huge source for bacteria to grow and eventually lead to pneumonia. We call this aspiration pneumonia. And pneumonia, when left untreated, can actually lead to respiratory failure and eventually death as well. So this is actually why a lot of anesthesiologists or surgeons will ask if you are on a GLP-1 agonist before going under anesthesia for surgery. And that is because GLP-1s increase your risk for aspiration, but when you are under anesthesia, your natural gag reflex or the reflex you have when you cough and you say things go down the wrong pipe, you know, we, we immediately start coughing any of that product up. But when you're under anesthesia, you're not able to. 
And the esophageal sphincter is also, you know, relaxed under anesthesia. So it increases your risk of aspiration even further. The next complication I want to talk about is called a small bowel obstruction. So basically a small bowel obstruction is almost the most severe form of gastroparesis where gastroparesis is slowing down the gut motility. A small bowel obstruction is when there is food or any sort of byproduct stuck in the GI tract and it's not moving at all. And that causes obstruction and that obstruction can continuously build if you do not treat it promptly. My biggest concern with the small bowel obstruction is if the abdominal pressure starts to increase and that obstruction starts getting bigger, it can actually push on the blood vessels of the GI tract and of the intestines and actually cut off the blood supply to the intestines and lead to what's called mesenteric ischemia or basically death of the gut. And that is a surgical emergency. And if left untreated, just like necrotizing pancreatitis, it can lead to end organ damage and organ failure as well as death. So what should you watch out for? If you have any sort of significant abdominal pain associated with abdominal swelling and distension, almost like a painful bloated feeling, as well as vomiting and the inability to pass any sort of stool or gas. And I think the latter is the most important. If you're not able to pass any sort of gas and it feels like it's building up, I would go to the ED immediately and make sure that there is not a small bowel obstruction building up. The next side effect I wanna talk about is hypoglycemia or severely low blood sugar. Hypoglycemia is most commonly seen in people who are on GLP-1 agonists, but are also on other antihyperglycemics at the same exact time. So in a lot of my patients, they'll be on insulin or sulfonylureas like glipizides while also starting on a GLP-1 agonist. And this significantly increases your risk of having too low of a blood sugar. My biggest concern when it comes to hypoglycemia is the neurological symptoms that it can cause. The brain thrives on glucose when it comes to neurological signaling and low blood sugar can lead to seizures, it can lead to coma, and it can even lead to death. So how can we prevent this? One thing I highly suggest for all of my patients with type 2 diabetes who are on GLP-1 agonists and are on other antihyperglycemics as well, such as glipizides or DPP-4 inhibitors or insulin, I highly recommend all of them, at least when starting out, use a continuous glucose monitor or a CGM. A CGM will actually track your blood sugars throughout the entire day and actually for almost like a 14 day period and will constantly be checking your blood sugar continuously. So you don't need to worry about finger sticks. And because it's through an app, it will actually alert you when your blood sugar gets too low. And it's important to keep track of these valleys of low blood sugars. So that way you know when to kind of time your carbohydrate intake appropriately. If your blood sugar is very low at night, I highly recommend adding in complex carbs or a higher carb source closer toward bedtime. Or if your blood sugar is actually higher when you first wake up, I recommend starting your day off with a higher carbohydrate meal. But having a continuous glucose monitor on you at all times will at least give you continuous data points to adjust your insulin needs, your other antihyperglycemics, and maybe even wean off of them. The next side effect I wanna talk about is more of a theoretical side effect, and that is medullary thyroid cancer. Medullary thyroid cancer is actually caused by the overgrowth and overproliferation of certain specific cells in the thyroid called parafollicular C cells, and they secrete a molecule called calcitonin, which helps decrease calcium levels in the blood. So the most common cause of medullary thyroid cancer is actually radiation exposure. And the second most leading cause is a genetic mutation. It's a mutation in the RET gene, but that increases your risk of having this specific type of thyroid cancer. And if you do have a family history of it, it is very important to get genetic testing done to make sure that you are not carrying that same mutation. So how is there an association between GOP-1 agonists and medullary thyroid cancer? And that's because in animal studies, when mice were exposed to GOP-1 agonists, it increased their risk for developing medullary thyroid cancer. That same risk though, does not translate to the human population. And that is because rodents or mice actually have a higher concentration of GOP-1 receptors on the medullary cells or the medullary C cells of the thyroid gland compared to human beings. So actually in current the current studies show that there is not an increased risk for medullary thyroid cancer in human beings, but there is a theoretical risk for it because of the animal studies. However, anybody that does have a family history of thyroid cancer or may have abnormal nodules, I highly recommend following up with an endocrinologist, having those nodules monitored and biopsied if needed, and actually you know, speak to your endocrinologist before starting on a GLP-1 agonist. Another side effect I wanna talk about is basically the increased risk of suicide and suicidal ideation that's been associated with GLP-1 agonists. 
The studies are currently ongoing. However, if you looked at my previous video, I talked about how GLP-1 agonists alter brain chemistry, right? They alter how the body processes dopamine and the levels of dopamine that's in circulation. That can lead to an increased risk for what we call anhedonia. And anhedonia is where you lose any sort of sensation for things that may have previously given you pleasure, which is why actually this medication is being studied for addiction, like alcoholism and gambling addiction, because these triggers often give a sense of euphoria. And because the GLP-1 agonists blunt this dopamine response and this dopamine cycle, it can cause these bad habits to not give that same dopamine release. However, you know, your body is not able to just localize where it wants to release dopamine or what rewards it wants to release dopamine to. So it will blunt your overall dopamine response. And this can actually increase the risk for suicidal ideation and, and unfortunately suicide. So, you know, if you do have a history of mental health disorders and you are not working with a psychiatrist, I highly recommend you speak to a psychiatrist and speak to your primary care physician before starting a GLP-1 agonist. The last and final side effect I wanna talk about is called an AKI. And I've probably talked about this before, but it's called acute kidney injury. And how does that happen? So an acute kidney injury can happen for a multitude of reasons. However, the ones that I see most commonly associated with GLP-1 agonists is due to severe dehydration. So this dehydration can be caused by a multitude of factors, whether it's from poor oral intake or through GI losses, such as nausea and vomiting, as well as diarrhea. However, the deadly aspect is when you have electrolyte abnormalities that are associated with these GI losses. So you can have low levels of sodium, potassium, and magnesium. And I think I've mentioned this before, but those electrolytes are so important when it comes to the electrical conductivity of the heart and making sure the heart functions properly. If these levels are thrown off balance, it can lead to abnormal heart rhythms, especially heart rhythms called VTAC, or worst case scenario, an abnormal heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. And that can actually cause your heart to not even beat, but actually just kind of shake in place and quiver. And that will ultimately, unfortunately, lead to cardiogenic shock and death. So how can this be avoided? If you are experiencing severe dehydration, you're not able to keep any sort of liquids down, or if you're losing a significant amount of liquids, I would highly recommend going to an ED to get evaluated. If you're feeling any sort of chest pressure, chest discomfort, or palpitations, please go to an emergency department immediately and get an EKG done, get your electrolytes checked, make sure everything is okay. All right, guys, that's all I have for this video. Like I've said previously, I'm a huge proponent of GLP-1 agonist therapy. I believe the positives greatly, greatly outweigh the negatives and the side effects. However, you know, I want to focus my channel on educating as well as keeping you guys in the loop and informed on up-to-date events. So when I see things in the hospital, I feel like it's my duty or obligation to let you guys know, especially when they are things that are related to GLP-1 agonists. So if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.